Having grown up in Philadelphia, I could sense the impending change in my surroundings as soon as I walked into my new school. Relocating an hour away from the bustling city would undoubtedly necessitate some adaptation, and by adaptation I mean welcoming the change with open arms. At my father's request and my mother's insistence, I assiduously kept myself out of trouble, avoiding any unneeded entanglements. The area's demographics were diversified with a mix of blacks, Hispanics, Italians, Jews, and generally hard-nosed Dutch descendants. They were not Amish or Mennonite, but rather devout German Lutherans who dominated the area. Despite the varied mix, I found it rather easy to fit in. However, I couldn't help but miss the company of my Philadelphia buddies. After graduation, I decided to stay put, primarily to be close to my family. Nonetheless, I returned to my former area on a frequent basis, maintaining close links with my childhood friends. My first employment was as a driver for a few oil delivery trucks. Over time, I moved into an interior position handling dispatch and orders. It became clear that I had a natural knack for the industry, and I could see myself as the owner of a comparable venture in the not-too-distant future. Forming friendships with people of the opposite gender came naturally to me, and my social life beyond my expectations. When I married, my mother was little disappointed because my wife, Elena, was not of Italian origin. However, she took every effort to ensure that Elena was received warmly and without reservation. Elena encouraged me to have a vasectomy after our two children were born. I had no issues to the notion, but as the children began school, Elena voiced a wish to return to the workforce. My father believed that it was not appropriate for a woman and mother to seek a career outside the home. While I didn't fully understand the reasons for his position at the time, upon reflection it appeared to be consistent with certain conventional ideals. I didn't object to Eileen, his decision to work, but I was uneasy with the prospect of her mingling extensively with individuals from her past, some of whom I didn't particularly like. Elena was heavily involved in a variety of extracurricular activities during her school years, which she truly liked. In contrast, I avoided such gatherings and the people affiliated with them, judging them as elite cliques based on mutual admiration. Despite the fact that Elena and I had previously been in relationships, we never discussed it, instead agreeing to keep our pasts to ourselves. After a decade of marriage, fissures appeared in our relationship. Elena had worked diligently in the claims department of a local national insurance firm. My fears were heightened when she began working overtime and giving up weekends for work. Six months later, the breaking point became vividly evident to me. This is when the seminar entered the picture. Marco, I do not understand what the problem is. It's only three days. I've already planned for your mother to care after the children while I'm abroad. You will be home in the nights. You can cook for yourself. Elena protested, completely unaware of my rising uneasiness. I could not believe she had the arrogance to ask who else was attending the session. I inquired, trying to remain calm. Her demeanor lightened slightly as she responded. Six girls from the department, Vivian, Wright, from Personnel and Derek. Hearing his name made me smile. It was incredible that she had no idea I was aware of her secret lunches and late-night work sessions with her immediate superior directors. Derek and Elena have a history of growing up together. He was the epitome of an overachiever in school, participating in every club and activity but sports. Do you think I'm a fool, Alina? I snapped. My fury and apparent perplexity flashed over her face. I do not comprehend. What exactly are you talking about? She responded innocently. I have known about you and Derek for six months. If you think I'm going to let you go away with him for three days, you're delusional. I replied, my tone caustic. Marco, you are misunderstanding. Derek is my supervisor. There is nothing going on between us. I'd never cheat on you. You are aware of this. She protested, her eyes pleading for comprehension. I looked down at the empty Budweiser can in my palm. My grasp tightens involuntarily. I slowly got from my chair and made my way to the kitchen. I tightened my fist and tossed the thin aluminum at the bin, missing by inches. The sound of the new can hissing as I opened the lid resonated in the tense silence as I returned to my seat. You are a good mommy, Elena taught youngsters. That is the only reason you're still here. I've already discussed everything with my mother. She told me to hold firm and hope that you will see sense for the sake of the children. If I leave you, the courts will grant you custody. I cannot let that happen. 
I described the weight of the issue hanging in the air. Did you tell your mother I was cheating on you? Elena's voice wavered, disbelief imprinted on her features. No, a church lady spilled the beans. I simply did not refute it. When she approached me, I confessed calmly. Her eyes widened with shock. You cannot be serious. I do not believe you. Why are you saying all of this? She implored desperation, lowering her tone and taking a large swallow of beer. I couldn't help smirking. Derek lives at 321 David Drive, only three blocks from your workplace. You and your employer regularly visit his residence three times a week. Each visit lasted nearly three hours. Could you perhaps explain what happens there for three hours? And while we are at it, could you please explain the overtime you have been clocking at work? Were you familiar with your office? Clean Lady also goes to church with my mother. Tears welled up in her eyes, and her lower lip trembled as she tried to find words. As long as you do not publicly humiliate myself or my family, please refrain from taking harsh action. However, if this changes, everything is off. You can stay or leave. You will never take my boys from me, I stated forcefully, filled with rage and despair. Elena arose immediately from her seat. Damn you, Marco. I absolutely despise you. She spat and stormed out of the room, tears flowing down her face. It was the first time Mom had ever sworn at me or made disparaging statements about my ancestry. The duchy in her head eventually appeared. We had two boys, Harry and Jack, and they shared a room with bunk beds. The third bedroom operated as a catch-all area. That is where I ended up sleeping. From then on, it was a rented residence. Despite having accumulated more than $60,000 for a down payment on her dream home, my fantasies had turned into nightmares. The seminar event was never discussed again. Elena stopped working over time and began taking her lunch to work. The atmosphere at home was more than just frigid. It was freezing and cold. My mother had not gotten any new information from her church contacts. Things seemed to be getting back to normal, but I couldn't ignore the uneasiness. There was an obvious lack of intimacy, and I realized I couldn't stay in that scenario much longer. Despite my doubts, I reluctantly decided to join Elena at her company's Christmas party. I didn't want to allow her to attend alone, so I felt I could pass the evening peacefully by staying out of the way. It seemed like a wonderful idea at the time, but it was fraught with problems. The corporation had rented out a large hall complete with a dance floor, a magnificent buffet table, and a few open bars. I could drink three beers all evening without feeling any negative consequences. When we arrived, the only accessible tables were near the company's top hierarchy, and they appeared to be purposely avoided by employees. For the first hour, everything appeared to be running properly. I saw Dirac across the room, casually mingling with his mates. Several of Elena's colleagues invited her to dance. Derek remained noticeably absent. I was pleased to let her have fun on the dance floor because dancing was not my cup of tea. As I sipped my third beer, I couldn't help but notice Elena and Derek's discreet exchanges of glances across the room. It was mostly nods and tiny head tilts, but it was clear that something was developing between them. I did my best to appear uninterested and bored while keeping a close eye on their interactions. As my wife excused herself to use the restroom, I quickly searched the room and noticed Derek was nowhere to be found. It was puzzling. After our intense disagreement at home, it seemed completely ridiculous for her to try to meet him while we were both in the same building. She could have met him at work without fear of being detected. I couldn't get the impression that her goal was to humiliate me by flaunting her relationship with Derek in front of everyone. By interacting with him at a company event, she would publicly brand me as a cuckold. As Elena disappeared down the hallway towards the facilities, Derek's friends stood gathered behind one of the bars, grinning smugly, before I went to the restroom. I took a detour to the head table and leaned in. I made a formal apologies for any disturbance just to get their attention. The people across the room, who had before smiled contentedly, suddenly appeared uneasy. They appeared puzzled how to help Derek in this unforeseen predicament. Entering the vacant ladies' room, first I went into the men's room. When I saw what happened next, it was a flurry of shock and indignation. They were engaged in an embrace. His back was to me, and his hand was crawling up her skirt to my dismay. She offered no opposition, 
I grabbed Derek by the collar and threw him against the wall, disregarding my wife's hysterical shouts, which echoed in the background with a quick movement. I brought him to the ground. As I was hauled directly to the center of the floor by his tie, the once vibrant hall became strangely hushed. The orchestra had stopped playing, and everyone's attention was focused on the developing drama. I surveyed the room and noticed that there were no offers of assistance for Derek. I'm sorry for interrupting your festivities. I'll depart now. But feel free to entertain yourselves with my cheating wife. As Derek fought to get up on his hands and knees, I declared my bitterness apparent. Elena stood in the doorway, her face a mixture of amazement and disbelief. It was unclear if her sorrow was caused by what I had done to her lover or the humiliating statement I had made to her colleagues. Frankly, it didn't bother me. As I stood immediately beneath the mistletoe, a sudden impulse overcame me. Before leaving, I delivered a quick kick to ensure he would not forget the incident any time soon. He collapsed to the ground in anguish. However, the observers said nothing. I called my mother from the car and asked her to stop by the house to pick up the boys. Going out of town for a few days seemed like a necessary getaway, and I had no intention of leaving the children with their mother. I doubted she would be able to adequately care for them. Driving aimlessly, I found myself making plans without a specific goal in mind. Thankfully, my boss did not object to giving me a week off. When I arrived home, my folks were already there. After depositing the babysitter's expenses, I helped prepare the boys for their grandmother's care. My quickly packed bag was largely full of socks and underwear, with a few shirts and pants tossed in just in case. Before leaving, I retrieved the cash box from the basement rafters. Given the low interest rates offered by banks, I had decided to retain the $62,000 hoard at home. Admittedly, it may appear silly, but it was a propensity I got from my mother, who kept large stashes dispersed throughout the kitchen. As I was going to turn out the lights, a cab arrived and dropped Elena off at the doorstep. She arrived silently, falling into the couch with no sound. Her face was one of concern rather than rage, perplexed and afraid. I made that obvious, didn't I? Only one rule. Please do not embarrass me or my family in public. You couldn't resist, could you? I spoke gently, seeing tears well up in her eyes before turning and going out the door. I emerged onto the school kill expressway around after nine o'clock. That party didn't last long for me. I decided to spend a couple of days in Atlantic City before returning home. But first, I needed to reconnect with my old pal, Luca. Luca owned a sandwich store in our old neighborhood. It wasn't one of the showy locations featured in Philadelphia trip books, Rather, it provided a local convenience for the surrounding population. His primary source of money came from other projects in which most of us either overlooked or were personally involved. He lived on the second floor and operated from the back room. Meeting Luca was like going down memory lane. After hearing about my situation, he offered to help. Marco, it will cost you twenty. Can you manage it, or do you need me to help you? Luca inquired. I have it up front. Not an issue. I responded boldly. Do you prefer it dirty or quiet? Luca asked. Transparent. No fuss, no mess. Nothing, I asserted. You are leaving for a few days. Have you got anything set up? Luca inquired further. No plans. I was thinking of going to Atlantic City. I replied. What about six days and seven nights at the Taj? Luca proposed. What exactly are you talking about, Luca? I questioned. I have some competitions coming in. I believe it would work out fairly nicely for you, Luca explained. That seems nice to me, I agreed. Are you going alone, Marco? Luca explored. Yeah, this was entirely done on the spur of the moment. I did not have time to invite anyone. I admitted that you shouldn't be alone. You need someone to confirm that you were present. Hold on a minute, Luca explained before picking up the phone and dialing a familiar number. Bella, it's Luca. Make yourself attractive and get your ass down here. Luca directed over the phone, chuckling before proceeding. Nope, nothing like that. Are you going on vacation? Marco, can you remember Bella, my brother, Michael's oldest? Luca asked me. Yeah, chubby, small creature with dark brown eyes, I remember. She was constantly laughing. How old is she today, I recall? Luca grinned at my memory of his niece. She's 23 now, Marco, and she's not overweight anymore. It suddenly occurred to me that Bella would be joining me on the journey to the seaside. 
Given that she was Luca's niece, the font made me feel uneasy. But after all, he was in charge of the entire operation. Marco. Do you own a credit card? Luca inquired. I have two of these. I replied that I had planned to cancel them on Monday morning. Do not do that. I want you to use those credit cards as often as possible. Meals out, room service, and possibly even some casino cash advances. But do not go overboard. You need credit card activity to indicate you were present. Spread it out over time so it doesn't appear that you slipped back home. It may cost you a couple of grand, but it's inexpensive insurance, Luca advised. Luca obviously knows his business. It all made perfect sense as I reflected on his suggestions. Bella entered the room. Marco, I have not seen you since you moved up to the sticks. You look fantastic, Bella exclaimed. I finally realized why Luca was smiling. Bella was wonderfully attractive. Her dark eyes were hypnotic, and any remains of baby fat she formerly had appeared to have moved to her chest. In my agitated state, I carelessly pushed over my chair and jumped to my feet. Marco needs someone to keep him company in Atlantic City for a few days. Are you ready for it? Luca inquired. Her demeanor shifted somewhat as he spoke. Aren't you still married? She inquired, directing her attention to me before I could react. Luca intervened. The marriage is ended, Bella. Marco needs a companion right now. I knew you had always liked him, so I thought of you first. Luca explained. Luca, I can't be a part of dividing someone's family. It is not appropriate for you to ask me to do this. Can't you just ask one of the girls to join him? I protested. I am not asking you to sleep with him. Simply keep him company and help him forget his concerns, Luca reasoned. Bella's expression changed, as if she had just put something together. She was not only beautiful, but also quick-witted. I apologize, she added, staring between Luca and me with a slight smile. I'd be pleased to accompany you, Marco, but you must promise to get me some saltwater taffy. We all share a smile. I will need approximately an hour to get ready. Luca, make sure he does not drink anything. I do not want to drive down there with a drunk. Bella directed as she left to grab her belongings, perhaps giving me a mischievous wink while Bella was gone. Luca and I discussed our chat. He gladly received my $20,000 and assured me of his total dedication. Except for the lengthy breakdown I gave Bella about the troubles with Alina, the trip to Atlantic City went smoothly. Her only remark was, Poor kids! Bella frowned when she saw the double beds in her room, but thankfully she did not catch my restrained chuckle. I had a strong hunch we'd only use one of them by the end of the week. All excellent things come with time. We gambled occasionally, but only in moderation. I was wise enough to realize that in the larger scheme of things, the odds were stacked against me. Bella was pleased with the quarter slots, while I was looking for a distraction. We spent much of our time eating and walking along the boardwalk. And of course, we saw every performance in town. The first night, I kept my gentlemanly approach. But by noon the second day, Bella and I were igniting sparks between the covers. My mother had been correct. I should have married an Italian girl. It was natural, and I didn't feel like I was betraying anybody. On the fourth day, we were preparing for dinner when we were interrupted by unexpected visitors. Two men, dressed in sports jackets rather than suits, stood at our door. My name is Lewis Coleman, and this is my partner, Oscar Jenkins. We're with the Berks County Special Crimes Task Force. Do you mind if we have a word? Marco Romano. Luis introduced them. Bella emerged from the restroom in her underwear. Before taking her bathrobe off the bed, she looked across at the males. Though slightly humiliated, she recognized the importance of the issue. Can you give me a sense of what we'll be discussing? I inquired. We'd like to talk about your connection with directors, Luis responded. I did not have a relationship with the directors. My wife did, I clarified. For some reason, they appeared uneasy. Coleman took the lead in conversation, while Oscar appeared absorbed with glancing at Bella. We understand, Mr. Romano, and are aware of the altercation you had with him last Friday at the Continental Insurance Christmas Party, Coleman explained. Is he filing charges? I inquired. No, he went missing, and we were hoping you could help us find him, Coleman answered. Gentlemen, before we begin, I would like to have someone from the Atlantic City Police Department present, and I do not mean just any officer. If you can arrange it with the lawyer, my lawyer, based on what I read, I concluded that my guests would not receive an immediate answer. Bella, 
Get dressed. We're going out for supper. Sorry, gentlemen, but we have reservations at six o'clock. The safari has extremely high stakes. I may be available to chat with you on Friday if necessary. I offered. They looked surprised by my remark. Why? Do you think anything happened to this guy? Perhaps he just left town for a bit. I suggested that he was picked up by a cab leaving Community General Hospital on Sunday morning, and no one has seen him since. Coleman showed that Bella had completed dressing, and I was slipping on my jacket. I've been here since Friday night, and you can confirm this with the hotel personnel. Now, if you'll excuse me, we're heading for some steaks. Any further questions? We can wait till Friday, I stated strongly. Yes, we anticipate to see you then. Coleman replied with a simple nod. I directed them towards the door. We rode down the elevator together, but no further words were said when we got to the lobby. They went to hotel security while Bella and I headed to the safari. When I returned home, Harry and Jack greeted me joyfully, and the saltwater taffy I had brought with me just added to their joy. Elena, on the other hand, appeared cold and distant. She clearly had no idea what had happened that day. Following my talk with the police, I spent the remainder of the afternoon with the boys and planned to speak with Alina later that evening. The boys were settled in front of the television for the evening, so I took a seat at the kitchen table and waited patiently for Elena to finish washing up. She appeared to be taking longer than usual by remaining sitting and unmoved. She finally turned to face me and sat down, her elbows resting on the form at the top. What have you done with Tarek? Her tone was neither accusing nor furious. Instead, she appeared genuinely concerned. Her eyes flickered between me and the room while she waited. My reaction. I was at Atlantic City all week. I have not seen Direct since the party, I responded. Did you hear him? She stated the facts plainly. I hope so, I replied bluntly. He remained in the hospital for two days. You broke his jaw and nose. She informed me. He earned it. I replied. She seems to have ran out of questions. What did you do with him in the men's room? I pressed after a brief silence. Elena gave no response. She sat, wringing her hands and avoiding eye contact, staring at the tabletop. Why did he put his hand up your skirt? I questioned, still met with silence. Why are you not at work? And why are the students home on a school day? I inquired further. I had to resign my job. There was no way I could return there. I took the boys out of school because your mother suggested you might come home today. Elena admitted it was time to face the challenges head on. I made it clear, Elena, there was just one rule. Do not do something that would embarrass myself or my family. A straightforward rule. Why did you feel compelled to break it? Both of you appeared intent on rubbing it in. Why? I demanded. My irritation grew with every syllable. Elena seemed increasingly nervous as we sat there. I banged my fist upon the tabletop with power. I asked you why. Damn it, please answer me, I insisted. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why. It's just happened. You were sitting there like a lost puppy, and we figured we could take advantage of the situation. We had no clue you would respond that way. You went crazy. I was terrified, she admitted, her voice shaking with passion. At the very least, she was displaying feeling. However, her explanation made no sense. I refused to dwell on it. They were dumb to chose that time and place to humiliate me. They had weeks to schedule their rendezvous before the celebration, and I wouldn't have known. No, their intentions were plain, and Elena's justifications would not change that. Elena, you've got three possibilities. You can choose to stay here and fulfill your role as a mother to your children. You can file for divorce and leave without custody of the children, or you can simply disappear from our lives entirely. However, if you decide to stay, please understand that we will not be living as husband and wife, and I will not tolerate any additional indiscretions with Derek or anyone else. When Derek's name came up, I made a clear statement. Elena burst into tears before she could reach a conclusion. She exited the room crying uncontrollably. It appeared that the conversation would have to be continued another day. Changes have been made. I arranged for a tiny apartment a few blocks from the house, close enough for the lads to visit whenever they wanted. Bella moved in with me. The cops interviewed me several more times before ending their investigation. Directors was last seen being picked up by a taxi outside the hospital, but his whereabouts are unclear, despite his family offering a reward for any information. No leads were forthcoming. Every evening I joined Elena and the boys for supper, and I made an effort to spend quality time with my sons on weekends. 
Despite being officially married, everyone knew Elena and I were no longer a couple. She frequently visited her parents and sister, which did not disturb me. There were no signs that she was seeing anyone else, despite the fact that she had quit her job after the Christmas party and showed no desire to find another. We never brought up the talk we had the first night I returned home. Elena played her role as a concerned mother flawlessly. The house was always clean, the boys were well-fed, and they wore clean clothing almost every day. I took care of all of the outdoor duties, including keeping the lawn and environs in good condition. Elena was given a weekly stipend of $200 to cover household expenditures, groceries, and personal necessities. Despite my offers to supply more, she consistently declined. We no longer used credit cards for Thanksgiving and Christmas. The boys and I spent time with my family, frequently joined by Bella. Elena usually spends the holidays with her own family, but she joined us on Christmas Eve to celebrate with the boys. Conversations about their mother's connection with me were difficult whenever Harry or Jack mentioned it. Elena and I refused to discuss the problem with them. I appreciated her attitude, but what could she possibly say? The exhaustion lasted for years, despite my brief explanation, which hardly captured the nuances of our position. Continuous issues and conflicts occurred. Nonetheless, we managed to get through them. Initially, everything were going well for Bella. However, over time, she began to spend more time with her family in Philadelphia and less with me. I could not blame her. I was grateful to her for her efforts to smooth the split. Despite the hurdles, I was unable to divorce Elena, and as long as the boys remained at home, I couldn't bring myself to ask her to leave. These were self-imposed limitations that I felt obligated to respect. I despised the entire situation, but I was unable to develop an alternative strategy. However, the boys discovered a means to accomplish just that. When Harry was 16, everything reached a breaking point. A new kid at his school who happens to be related to my wife's ex-lover. Harry was deliberately provoked over the scenario. This was the first time this concern had been raised. Derek's nephew was taken to the hospital, which caught Harry off guard, and I received a call to pick him up from school. He was suspended for two weeks and was facing possible assault charges. Unfortunately, Jack witnessed the incident and insisted on stepping in to help his brother. He ended up losing two teeth, but gained Harry's respect for his support. Elena greeted us at the door as she returned home with her sons. Harry scolded his mother for not telling them the truth about the incidents four years ago. Elena remained mute, providing no defense. As her eldest son vented his rage... Sensing the tension, I took Jack to the dentist and left them alone to deal with their problems. Jack didn't seem disturbed by his missing teeth, but I was worried about the upcoming dental bills. When we got home, Alina was nowhere to be seen. Her car remained parked, but she had left without a word or explanation, leaving Harry perplexed. I took a week off from work to attempt to settle things down and resolve the matter. Elena's parents and sister stayed silent toward me after a week of no communication from Elena. Her location and intentions remained unknown. Bella and I decided to move into the house together. Sharing a bed was strange at first, but the lads quickly embraced the arrangement, which surprised me. One day while I was at work, Elena and everything associated with her vanished from the house. I didn't ask what Bella did with it, and I had no desire to know. Bella seamlessly inherited all of Elena's previous obligations. To make things easier, I gave her a few credit cards. It felt strange to know that I trusted my mistress more than my wife. I sold Elena's automobile and bought a new one for Bella. With this new arrangement, family reunions became less tense. Bella was happy and my mother was ecstatic. Harry and Jack had no additional troubles at school, and Derek's nephew never returned. Despite these advancements, I remained legally married. After two months of uncertainty about Elena's location, I decided to take action and report her as missing to the police. However, I framed it as a case of a runaway spouse, knowing that I could use the report as proof when applying for divorce on abandonment grounds. I carefully waited another two months before submitting the divorce paperwork. Knowing that a year of absence was required for the divorce to be granted, I was preparing ahead and scheming for the future. Life in the household eventually settled into a new routine. Harry and Jack adjusted well to Bella's presence, although they never addressed her as mom, preferring to name her Bella. Our dynamics have improved dramatically. 
We began to look more like a family than we had in years. Then, unexpectedly, I received a final decree of divorce. I was freed from my marriage. Two weeks later, Bella and I traveled to Elkton to exchange vows, cementing our bond with Harry, who graduated from school and joined the Air Force, while Jack enrolled in meat-cutting school in Toledo a year later. Changes happened quickly. Before we knew it, Bella and I found ourselves alone. Despite our readiness to move forward, we never received word from Alina, leaving her whereabouts and intentions unknown. Mom and Dad relocated to Ocala, encouraging us all to promise to visit them at least twice a year. With no strong ties to keep us reading, Bella and I decided to go back to our roots in Philadelphia. Jack, after graduating from his school, found a position at a prestigious butcher shop in West Chester. We treasured the time we spent with him because he always had something enjoyable to share whenever we met. A year later, we found ourselves at one of Bella's niece's weddings. A grand affair, typical of Italian celebrations in the city of brotherly love. The event was teeming with guests, mostly family members, along with a sprinkling of opportunists seeking free drinks and food. Nevertheless, the festivities were lively and abundant. During the evening, I noticed Bella displaying a hint of unease, her gaze wandering across the dance floor on several occasions. Though I tried to spot what had caught her attention, I saw nothing out of the ordinary. However, when she excused herself to visit the restroom, a sense of apprehension washed over me. Observing her as she made her way to the back of the hall, I noticed her meeting up with one of her old friends. Amidst the chatter and socializing, Bella's behavior caught my attention. Instead of heading to the restroom, as she initially claimed, she approached one of Luca's assistants. Her gestures directed towards a nearby table. There sat three guys and three girls, looking like they were trying a bit too hard to impress. The girls were adorned in flashy attire, giving off an era of ostentation. Returning to our table, Bella wore a thoughtful yet composed expression. Marco, we've got a slight issue. I gathered that much from your little reconnaissance mission. Care to elaborate? You need to stay calm. In a few minutes, one of the guys from Janet's table will come over here and try to provoke you. What do you mean, provoke me? He'll likely say some offensive things about me to get a rise out of you. When you react, they'll jump in and attack you. And I'm supposed to just let that happen? Temporarily? Yes. Wait until Thomas and the others are ready. You might need to fend off one of them. But that should be the extent of it. What exactly do you mean by play along with him? Let him insult me and then agree him if he calls me a prostitute. Ask him how much he's willing to pay. Something like that. But whatever you do, don't let him provoke you. What's all this about? Why are these guys targeting me? Take a look at Janet's table. Okay, focus on the woman with the short platinum hair. Got her, look closer. Whoa, that's Elena. What's she doing here? Elena's boyfriend is somehow connected to the bride. It seems she's still holding a grudge against you, and she orchestrated this setup to get back at you when she saw you were here. I guess she's out for revenge while you and Lucas crew handle things here. Janet and I will have a chat with Elena in the ladies' room. It's not going to be pleasant. I felt uneasy about the situation unfolding. This was supposed to be a joyous occasion, a memorable night for the bride. It wasn't right for a couple of thugs to spoil it. When I noticed Elena's companion rising from his seat, I stood up and made a polite excuse to the table. Bella shot me a curious glance, but seemed to grasp the situation. Nonchalantly, I strolled over to the sign fire exit where people were stepping out for a smoke. The boyfriend nodded to his companions, signaling them to follow unseen by them. Three men emerged from the back of the bar, each wielding a Louisville slugger kept behind the counter outside. About half a dozen individuals were puffing away by the fire exit with a firm tone. I instructed them to leave, and surprisingly, they complied without resistance. There must have been an urgency in my voice. I walked a short distance away and paused, then turned back. The trio emerged, initially smiling, but their expressions quickly as the door clicked shut behind them. Their grins vanished upon spotting the three bat-wielding figures and the bride's father waiting for them at the altercation, ended swiftly lasting no more than thirty seconds. And I didn't have to resort to violence. Apologies for any inconvenience caused to and your family on this special evening. I expressed feeling like a character straight out of a mob movie. Thank you for handling it discreetly he responded, shaking my hand before returning to his daughter's side. 
After expressing gratitude to Luca's men for their assistance, I went inside to locate Bella. They remained behind to tidy up the aftermath. Sensing it was time to depart, I couldn't find Bella, and Elena's table was now deserted. Jack, having caught wind of the disturbance, approached me at the bar with some of his friends. Dad, what's going on? My initial instinct was to keep quiet, but it failed. Your mother was here with her new boyfriend. I don't need to hear more than that, he replied with a grin, ordering a beer from the bartender. We engaged in conversation about other topics for about an hour. Eventually, Bella appeared, looking a bit disheveled. Where have you been? I asked. She smirked mischievously. Janet and I had to accompany your ex-wife to the hospital. She wasn't feeling well, Jack, and I couldn't help but chuckle. Marco, can we head home now? It was a long, eventful night, but filled with laughter. We never encountered Elena again. Bella and I remain happily together in our old neighborhood. Here is the next story. After a fruitful phone call that left Mr. Gerald Hayes jubilant, I found myself reflecting on my adeptness in maneuvering finances with my expertise. I seamlessly navigated the transfer of over $10 million across four countries and through the channels of 12 banks, effectively laundering his funds and shielding him from any prying governmental investigations. I am Thomas Parker, a figure esteemed for my prowess in money, movement, asset concealment, and safeguarding individuals from legal repercussions. I follow a tight policy of non-involvement in my clients' issues to protect myself from federal investigation and keep my ethical compass stable. While I am aware of the nature of my clients' activities, I follow the concept of don't ask, don't tell. My efforts have not only resulted in significant money, but also established me as a professional financial strategist. I currently handle 16 bank accounts scattered over 8 countries, 10 cryptocurrency wallets, and run a firm that manages my assets, which include my home, vehicles, and all costs. Drawing a small salary of $50,000 per year from the company covers my incidental expenses by ensuring that the company earns a nominal profit in order to maintain legitimacy and avoid taxation. I protect myself from civil responsibilities, lawsuits, and future divorce settlements because my documented net worth is tiny and my income is conspicuously low. Many of my clients, seeing the value I bring to fixing their financial problems, have offered me a variety of rewards as symbols of appreciation. These gestures vary from women to trips and even protection, almost anything one can conceive. Until now, I've declined all such offers. However, my current circumstances have forced me to reevaluate, prompting me to accept aid with monitoring, protection, and the use of certain assertive techniques. My business companions were ready to repay me for the services I had provided. At home, my wife Melissa perceives me only as a financial advisor, which is somewhat correct, certified as a financial counselor and a certified public accountant. I play that part. However, she is unaware of my earnings, the size of my holdings, or the existence of my offshore accounts. All she knows is that her firm pays for $5 million estate vehicles and living bills. Melissa lives a luxurious life without the necessity for job. Therefore, the question never came up. Having a new luxury car every year and an unlimited budget for shopping and pleasure. Melissa appeared satisfied throughout our five-year marriage and enjoyed our time together. She oozed happiness, especially during our personal moments, where we shared many wonderful encounters. However, unbeknownst to her, a symbolic Category 5 hurricane loomed above our paradise. Melissa and I courted for two years before marrying at the early age of 25. Melissa, five years into her marriage, had recently turned 30. With her amazing shape, long legs, and fascinating face, she might easily be considered a trophy wife by many. Her blonde hair and beautiful blue eyes grabbed men's attention wherever she went, often resulting in flirty advances. Nonetheless, she instantly flashed her wedding band in a gleaming three-carat diamond ring, demonstrating her dedication to our marriage. Prior to our marriage, I discovered Melissa had dated Jason Nelson to bury her college years. She was completely in love with Jason, but he was not willing to settle down at the time. Instead, he enlisted in the Marines, causing their connection to slowly disintegrate. However, it became clear to me that Melissa had never fully let go of her affections for Jason. Eight years later, Jason had returned to our hometown, after finishing his military service. When Jason returned, 
he naturally sought out old acquaintances, including my wife. Melissa had always been under his spell, and when he got her cell phone number from a mutual friend, he started messaging and calling her, hoping to reconnect for old time's sake. Melissa's conduct had started to change six weeks ago. Her shame over her clandestine connection with Jason most likely drove this adjustment. Her increasing attention to me even in intimate situations was appreciated, although it differed from her typical manner. Melissa had always been alert and energetic, but her actions now suggested that something was wrong. I vowed not to wait passively for answers, but rather to keep a closer check on her. At a weekend BBQ, a friend casually mentioned Jason's return to town. It occurred to me that his arrival coincided with changes in Melissa's conduct. The next day, I contacted one of my trustworthy business associates and told him about the problem, asking for his help. He quickly volunteered his support, seeing an opportunity to repay me for the money benefits I had won for him and the legal problems I had assisted him in avoiding. After I provided him with all pertinent information, he informed me that his team would investigate the situation immediately, leveraging their knowledge and navigating the deep and black web, as well as numerous surveillance measures. My collaborators produced a complete four-inch file on Jason Nelson, which included everything from his birth certificate to his college credentials, family history, and military service documents. I found myself with a dossier that was more extensive than his own mother's. I also received a daily printout of his text messages, which showed an alarming frequency of over 15 messages each day sent to my wife, Melissa. Although the method by which this knowledge was collected remained unknown, I refrained from investigating more. Initially, the texts appeared benign, reminiscent of old pals reconnecting. However, within the first week, they became sexually active. While I was relieved to see Melissa first rejecting his approaches, my uneasiness grew as his perseverance wore down her defenses, prompting her to return his flirtations. My outrage over this predatory behavior grew as it became clear that Melissa still had feelings for this person. It seemed evident to me that disaster was on the horizon. After four weeks of constant flirtation and text messages, he persuaded Melissa to meet him for lunch. The boldness of his request that she dress provocatively while stating his desire for her made me furious. To my dismay, Melissa not only accepted, but she proposed removing her underwear and reminiscing about previous encounters. My rage had reached a boiling point, forcing me to seek assistance from my business associates who provided suggestions on how to address the matter. We prepared a strategy to confront this individual while they were having lunch ensuring that someone was close for protection if necessary. My friend's team's diligent observation let us establish the exact time and location of the encounter, allowing us to prepare properly. Thursday, June 16th. When I entered the restaurant, I noticed them right away, nestled in a hidden corner. My heart hammered as I saw Melissa dressed provocatively in a low-cut dress without a bra, reigniting my rage. They sat side by side in a quiet booth, their backs were turned to the rest of the restaurant, and they appeared to be very comfortable in each other's presence. As I reached their table, I observed a burly man trailing behind me, most likely one of my backups. Melissa and her buddy looked up as I welcomed them. Hello, Melissa. I spoke casually as I slid into the booth opposite them. The big figure who had been following me was now quietly positioned several tables away, greeting Melissa with a warm smile. I inquired, Will you please introduce me to your companion? As I locked eyes with Melissa, the atmosphere became more tense. Jason's look indicated uncertainty. My wife's face showed a mix of shock and guilt. Despite her attempts to remove her hand from Jason's grip, he held on tightly. His smile turned into a sly smirk, indicating his defiance. The bold flirt was clearly not going to give up. Hi, this is Jason Nelson. Jason, meet my hubby, Thomas. Melissa's voice quivered as she gave the introduction. Her uneasiness was evident, in stark contrast to Jason's smug air. He stayed motionless, wearing a sneer that appeared to tease me, silently establishing his control as if to say, I have your wife, buddy, and there's nothing you can do about it. I approached Melissa squarely, attempting to remain calm. I am sorry to disturb your meal, but I need to speak with my wife quietly for a few minutes. Do you mind stepping out of the booth? Despite the internal turmoil, I demanded that my tone remain constant reluctantly. 
Jason let go of her hand and left the booth, allowing Melissa to rise up, clutching her purse protectively to her chest. She stood between Jason and me, plainly apprehensive, as I led her to the back of the restaurant towards the restrooms. Her silence said volumes, weighted with shame and trepidation at being discovered in such compromising circumstances with Jason. I walked her into the vacant men's room, where the tension was palpable, prepared to confront the problem. Head on. Melissa, why are you not wearing a bra? And that dress is just too exposing. I don't understand why you would treat me so disrespectfully, I cautioned. Frustration seeped into my voice. Tears flowed down her cheeks as she stood there, speechless and shaking, holding the dress at her waist and gently turning her towards the mirror, forcing her to see her reflection. Is this how you present yourself when I'm not present? Melissa, what are you playing at? Are you trying to promote yourself as a local prostitute? This behavior is completely unacceptable to my wife. I expressed my disappointment clearly in a frantic plea. She yelled out, No, it isn't as it seems. I understand how it appears to have a valid explanation. You will understand once I have explained it. I promise. She stammered hastily, taking down the dress that had been written up too high in an authoritative and grave tone. She had not heard from me before. I spoke deliberately. Every word carries weight. It is clear that we need to address this situation. If you have any desire to save your marriage, you will faithfully follow my advice. However, if you choose otherwise, do not bother going home because our marriage will be irreversibly damaged. Right now, you will take your purse, leave this business without looking at your partner, and drive home, make a pot of coffee, and wait for my return. I should not be more than ten minutes behind. You are not allowed to contact your boyfriend or anybody else until we have had our discussion. I shall manage the explanation of your leaving. I noticed she avoided my look, most likely due to shame for being caught in this circumstance. Should you fail to follow my instructions? Do not expect to find shelter at home tonight. I will contact you with more information on how to proceed from that point forward. Just one more thing. Don't change out of that dress. I want you to be precisely where you are now, waiting for me. The story is told on Melissa's behalf. Oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? Jason reached out to me. I was originally relieved to learn that he was safe and out of the military. I was always concerned about his well-being. Jason was my first love, and I struggled to let go after he left me years ago. Although deeper romantic feelings had dissipated, I still cared deeply for him. I know I love Tommy, and he has been the focus of my universe since we met. I would never want to ruin our connection or cause suffering, therefore this circumstance is tearing me apart. Jason's flirtations and lovely words struck into a part of me that I thought I had long forgotten. He had a way of making me feel like a naive schoolgirl again, and I despised my inability to reject his approaches. Despite my efforts to reject him, his continuous flirting and messaging gradually warmed me up, and I agreed to meet him for lunch. Engaging in these chats with Jason made me feel overwhelmed with remorse and self-loathing. Deep down, I felt I was betraying Tommy's confidence in our relationship. I should have been honest with Tommy from the start, alerting him about Jason's return to town and our correspondence. Keeping it a secret burdens my conscience, and I regret it more than words can describe. Jason has a special appeal that draws me in. And when he asked me to wear something attractive... I found myself green, although knowing it was inappropriate. I stopped, overcome with guilt for even considering having dinner with him, let alone taking such a risk or wearing such an outfit. Nonetheless, his compelling arguments made me powerless to resist. Despite my inner conflict, a text from Jason stating his want to see me pushed me even further down this path. Although I resisted the impulse to confide in Tommy, I reasoned that a simple lunch for nostalgia's sake would be insignificant, only a quick reunion, as Jason phrased it. He had a knack of enticing me into doing things despite my better judgment. I'll admit that seeing him in the restaurant brought up a range of emotions in me. My lingering desire to him gave me a strange yet wonderful sense. I've always sensed a certain spark between us and now. After eight years in the Marines... He appeared even more seductive, a mass of rugged, gorgeous strength capable of capturing any woman's attention. My cheeks flushed with shame as he mashed his lips on mine and led me into the private booth. It was like a blast from the past as we shared chuckles, rekindling a sense of familiarity that made it appear as if he had never left. 
Happiness and excitement surged up inside me, and his hand encircled mine on the table, creating a sense of protection and warmth during those fleeting moments of laughter and enjoyment. Tommy's quick entrance destroyed their delusion. Suddenly he was standing in front of us, then sitting across from us, a chilling grin on his face. Dread overcame me as I grasped the gravity of our personal moment in front of Tommy. His gaze fell on our entwined hands, and my heart plummeted as I saw the mix of grief and wrath in his eyes. I wished to bridge the gap, to express my affection for him while also acknowledging the suffering of the race. Nonetheless, guilt immobilized me. The scornful look he gave me broke my heart. The man I'd spent five years loving now looked at me with disgust, seeing myself entwined with another, an ex-lover no less. I sat there paralyzed by indecision and unable to say anything. My cheeks flushed with shame as he mashed his lips on mine and led me into the private booth. It was like a blast from the past as we shared chuckles, rekindling a sense of familiarity that made it appear as if he had never left. Happiness and excitement surged up inside me, and his hand encircled mine on the table, creating a sense of protection and warmth during those fleeting moments of laughter and enjoyment. Tommy's quick entrance destroyed their delusion. Suddenly, there he was, standing before us, then seating across from us with a terrifying grin engraved across his face. A wave of emotion flooded over me as I recognized the gravity of our intimate moment in front of Tommy. His gaze fell on our entwined hands and my heart sunk as I saw the pain and rage in his eyes. I wished to bridge the gap, to show my love for him and the race's pain. Nonetheless, guilt immobilized me. The scornful look he gave me broke my heart. The man I had spent five years loving now looked at me with disgust, seeing me entwined with another, an ex-lover no less. I sat there, paralyzed by indecision and unable to say anything. Tommy's desire to speak with me sent a chill down my spine. I readied myself for the inevitable, confirmation that our relationship had ended. Uncertainty filled my mind as I entered the men's room with him. I could only image what went through his thoughts, and in that moment, remorse felt like a crushing load, similar to that of an infidelity-stricken spouse. His request that I come home and wait for his arrival rang true with an uncomfortable intensity. His demeanor sent shivers down my spine, causing a genuine fear within me. I knew I needed to listen to him in order to save our marriage and explain why I was acting the way I was. It was important to mend what had been broken, so I silently agreed to his requirements. As he declared his plan to confront Jason alone, I felt a flash of anxiety. Jason's towering physique and eight years of naval training made him a significant threat to Tommy. By remaining silent... I hoped to persuade him not to take such a dangerous step. Recognizing the futility of my protestations, I tried to show my regret. Tommy's insistence on my departure, along with his surety of his approaching return, filled me with dread. His warning not to change my entire life served as a foreboding reminder that I would soon be called to account for my choices. How did I let Jason talk me into this? He's the last person I want in my life, I just wanted to recall and have some innocent fun, but in retrospect, it appears that I was on the edge of betraying Tommy with Jason. Damn that. How can I fix this mess? I felt the weight of everyone's gaze on me as I walked through the restaurant and to my car. I couldn't stomach looking at Jason, knowing. He must be wondering where I was going. It took me a few moments to collect myself enough to drive home. That drive felt like an eternity. Tommy's anguished expression brought tears to my eyes. How could I have damaged him in this way? I cannot believe I let Jason manipulate me, and now I need to find a way to make things right with Tom. Damn that. I'm in serious jeopardy due of Jason and my own idiocy. When I got home, I brewed some coffee and sat there, thinking what happened during their chat. How long till Tommy arrives? Will rage be unleashed? Can I save our marriage? I have to. I can't picture life without Tommy and he needs to understand that he is the only person I truly love and want in my life. The story is told on Thomas's behalf from the restaurant, as well as my chat with Jason. I returned to the table and spoke with Jason. Well, it appears Melissa will not be back, and I wanted to speak with you. I'm sure you're aware that Melissa still has feelings for you and is easily misled, as proven by today and the previous few weeks. However, it is critical for you to understand that she is dedicated to me in marriage, and I am not willing to share, I continued. I am not possessive or unreasonable. 
So this afternoon, I will give Melissa the option of remaining in our marriage or leaving me for you, but not both. She will make this decision alone, with no influence from you. May the best man win. And if she picks you, so be it. However, if she decides to stay in her marriage, she will no longer communicate with you. If you haven't heard from her today, I expect you to avoid contacting her again. Do you comprehend what I am saying? Jason replied. Listen, I will contact her whenever I want. She is a capable adult who makes her own decisions. You do not possess her. One thing is for certain, she will eventually return to me. She can't resist. I'm sorry, but you'll have to accept that, he replied with his typical sneer. Jason, I hoped you'd be a little more reasonable. You're quite the catch, with your rugged good looks and muscular build. Surely there are innumerable single women out there who would love to have your attention. Why can't men like you simply steer clear of married women? You see, Jason, you might be the charismatic, gorgeous guy who still has Melissa's heart. But you are underestimating me. Listen, Jason, you don't know anything about my life or the circles I hang out with. And this, my friend, is where you make your first mistake. I know a lot more than you might assume. How are your parents, Gabriel and Natalie, doing? They appear to dote over the two pets. Rocky and Roxy, don't they? It's been a long time since you saw your sister Christine in Austin. Her three girls must be growing up quickly, and I'm sure they'd enjoy a visit from their uncle Jason. And what about your best friend Bob? His girlfriend is pregnant, and it appears like the baby will be a boy. She may not have told him yet, but I am confident he will be overjoyed. Your efforts in reaching out to Melissa has also been acknowledged. You may consider yourself a strong guy, but I have contacts in my area of business. Let's just say they are not to be trifled with. They owe me more than a few favors— I smirked and responded as you so confidently put it. Let's find out tonight who genuinely has power. Will she select a manly charmer like you, or will she stick to her five-year marriage vows? You see, Jason, I'm addressing this matter civilly. I'm a 40, her choice. Her decision will be clear. She can choose to be with you and say goodbye to me and her husband. If that is a resolution, I will take it graciously and wish you both the best. However, I will not spend my life with a lady who wants another man. It will certainly sting, but I'd rather let her go now and go on. In contrast, if she chooses to remain faithful, there will be changes based on her recent behavior with you. The betrayal of trust demands the restoration. Concerning you, if she decides to stay with me, you will end all touch with her. No text messages, emails, phone conversations, or encounters with mutual friends. If you happen to run into her at a restaurant, party, or club, you will vanish from her life completely. You will leave immediately. No covert operations or attempts to reach out behind my back as the consequences will be severe. Your loved ones will suffer the consequences of your recklessness. Do you understand the gravity of the situation outlined? Do you understand how serious my stance is? Jason sat there, his face frozen in shock, dealing with a tornado of emotions and thoughts. How can you have such deep understanding of my family and me? He finally managed to express himself in a voice tinged with surprise and distrust. His interlocutor remained calm. His statements, however, carried an undercurrent of danger. Let's just say I've made some unsavory relationships over the years. My outer aspect may fool you, yet there is more to me than meets the eye. Jason began to understand the enormity of the issue. So you are honestly considering letting her leave me for another man? He questioned with incredulity, darkening his tone. The other man's response was unwavering. I always fulfill my promises. If she strays, she will have made her decision. But if she remains faithful, she will stay with me. There is no intermediate ground. Jason established himself with a hopeful tone. I hope you keep your promise about providing us peace because she has made it apparent that she wants to be with me. She has expressed her wish, and I will not sit idly by. Jason tried to project confidence, but he couldn't shake the lingering uncertainty behind his words. This person emanated arrogance. I couldn't help but think that he could be on to something. The truth would be revealed soon. I spoke as I stood up to leave my seat. I hope to never cross paths with you again or indulge in unethical behavior. But time will tell. As I walked away, a figure in the shadows rose, throwing a malevolent gaze at Jason before leaving a minute later. Jason clearly understood. I had someone looking out for me, challenging his perception of me as a submissive and naive spouse. Driving home, my mind raced with ideas of whether the lady I adored would ever share my bed again. 
Would she choose him over me or stick to her marriage vows? Melissa had no idea how far-reaching her decision would be. If she chose Jason, she would be left with little more than alimony. Based on my limited income, the company-owned car would be immediately reclaimed. Similarly, the residence registered in the company's name would not be within her reach. She would be homeless and without a means of transportation. Our shared bank accounts had a small quantity, which we would divide, leaving her with less than $5,000 in cash. Without job or marketable skills, her income potential would be confined to the minimum salary. With Jason still unemployed, her lifestyle would shift from luxury to scraping by in a small apartment, most likely seeking work at a store like Walmart to make ends meet. The course of events promises to be intriguing. As I entered the house, I was met with an unsettling silence. Melissa sat at the kitchen table. Her demeanor was strained. Tears welled up in her eyes as she gulped coffee. After pouring myself a cup, I sat across from her. Melissa, I'm aware of everything, even the conversations you've had with Jason before inquiring further. Understand that I have contacts through my business operations and some only big favors. They are not people you would want to cross paths with. I understand your remorse, but apologies have little weight now. Your actions today have shattered my trust and violated the terms of our marriage by putting him before me. You have demonstrated an obvious disdain for our partnership. You know me well enough to know that I do not accept disrespect. Some define infidelity only in physical terms, but in my opinion, even the slightest thought of another guy crosses the line. Your chats with Jason make it plain that you have violated limits— in my opinion, the seductive dress and intimate gestures represent treachery. The lack of physical contact is the only reason we're having this topic. It is critical for you to understand that I will not tolerate sharing you with anybody else, particularly a cheating spouse. I'm aware of the link you formerly had with Jason, and I understand that there are residual feelings. However, let me be clear. I will not tolerate you being with him or anybody else while you are still married to me. I haven't taken drastic action yet because my love for you is deep, and I'm determined to save our relationship. But first, I need to pose a question. And I expect honesty, as I may already know the truth. Did you allow any intimacy or touching while you were with him? Has anyone other than myself ever crossed that limit in our marriage? No, never. I swear it's always been you. But were you willing to consider the notion today? She dropped her head, tears falling down her cheeks. I do not know. This wasn't my intention. I'm terribly sorry for everything. I feel so foolish. Please forgive me, Tommy. Well, if he had touched you, our talk would have ended. Aside from some hand-holding and messaging, nothing appears to have happened to bring our marriage to an end. Nonetheless, I am profoundly disappointed in your behavior. Now tell me why you chose that suggestive dress. Were you going to seduce him and betray me? God, no. I'd never do it. It's difficult to explain. But all I wanted was to feel attractive again and experience some former sentiments. I understand it was silly and selfish, but he has a way of influencing me. I never meant to sleep with him. You must believe me, Melissa. I want to believe you. But your actions today forced me to confront a serious subject, one that requires an honest response. I've made it obvious that I will not share you with another man, and I will not be married to someone who has feelings for someone else. So this is the option I'm providing you, and it's something you should think about seriously. Because once you've decided there's no going back, I won't tolerate betrayal or disrespect again. I know you love me, and I understand the history you have with Jason. That is why I am giving you the choice between Jason and our marriage. If you select him, I will let you travel to shore provide a fair divorce settlement, and ensure both of your safety without seeking vengeance. Alternatively, you can opt to remain in our marriage. Remain committed to me and keep our promises. It's a straightforward decision with serious ramifications. If you choose, Jason, I will expect you to leave the house with your stuff by the weekend, and I will begin divorce processes right away. If you decide to remain married, you must cut all links with Jason. Today and forever. He'll be dead to you. I reaffirmed the same criteria I had set for Jason, emphasizing that they could never be in the same area at the same time, and that I would know if they were. She agreed without hesitation to my requirements. Melissa, you have the opportunity to redeem yourself today.
a unique opportunity to pick between a former flame and your faithful husband. I'm going to take a shower, and when I return, I'll await your decision. Choose wisely. As I turned to leave the kitchen, she interrupted quickly. Of course it is you, honey. I choose you. I love you, and I do not want anyone else. Melissa, your actions betrayed me profoundly. I heard what you said, but I need you to sit with this for a bit and really reflect. If we are to remain together, trust must be rebuilt, and the sorrow and anger you have caused will not go away overnight. Take your time and respond after I return. This decision is too important to rush, especially given your actions today and your continued love for Jason. I stated forcefully before, leaving her with tears flowing down her cheeks. She hid her head in her hands. I took my time in the shower and dressed when I returned to the kitchen. She ran to me, engulfing me in a tight hold and showering me with kisses. Tommy, I will never leave you. I won't make that mistake again. I promise to make it up to you and be the ideal wife. You are my husband, and I want to spend our future together with children. Please do not abandon me. You are the only man I love. She requested for a tight grasp and ardent kisses. We hugged each other and kissed passionately. Then I escorted her to our bed, reclaiming my wife. In that time, we lay together in silence. The world fell away. Husband and wife were reunited. We both knew that nothing would ever separate us again. The story is told on Jason's behalf. Jason, the next day. Damn. There was no call from her. It appears she has decided to continue with that jerk. I can't believe this. The synergy we had, her demeanor. Everything led me to believe she would choose me. I wish I could have clinched the deal. That afternoon, she left Thomas without a second thought. Her husband definitely threw a kink into my preparations. Who is this guy? And how come he knows so much about myself and my family? Well, I'm not giving up yet. I still feel I can win her back. Sorry, Thomas, but you are about to lose your girlfriend. The narrative is told on Thomas's behalf. Three days following the confrontation. As expected, Jason couldn't resist sending Melissa a text message in an attempt to entice her away from me. Predictable. Fortunately, Melissa quickly showed me the message and refrained from replying. She knew I'd see it and was not taking any chances. I complimented her on her transportation agency and appreciated that she did not engage with him. I see it as a great start in rebuilding our trust. The next day, I decided to contact Jason and ask about his parents' quest for Rocky and Roxy. Jason's first reaction was to phone his parents, discovering their grief upon learning the dogs were missing. Jason realized that his actions, notably approaching Melissa despite my warnings, had caused them anguish. To underline the gravity of the situation, I had Rocky and Roxy temporarily vanish under my supervision, ensuring their safety while sending a clear message to Jason. Jason called me back right after chatting with his folks. His tone was vehemently angry. What the hell? What did you do? They must not be harmed or you will pay for it. Well, Jason, you are not the one making the decisions here. If anyone is facing penalties, it is you. I expressly told you not to contact Melissa, yet you ignored my warning. I also made it plain that if you did, you would go through suffering like you'd never experienced before. Consider this only a sample. The dogs are likely to return soon, but allow me to reiterate, this is your final warning. Do not attempt to contact Melissa again. Understood. Yes, but they must return uninjured because you chose to ignore my commands. I'll decide their fate however I see fit, and you will have to cope with the consequences. Now, your threat does not motivate me to be generous. In fact, I'm contemplating if they'll return at all. How does that sound, Jason? Perhaps I should tell your folks why their beloved dogs are disappeared. What are your thoughts? Okay, I apologize. Please bring them back and I will stay away. I promise that is a start. However, the dogs will not vanish the following time. Do we have an understanding? It's crystal clear. I swear I will keep out of her life and you will not hear from me again. So, when can I expect them back? They'll return home soon. But remember, Jason, I'm a long way away. I cannot control everything, and everyone I'm dealing with has their own agendas. I will communicate with them and see what I can do. Let us hope we never have to have this talk again, because the next time there will be no words spoken and you will be dealing with much larger issues. The next night, around 3 a.m., the relieved parents were filled with delight when their beloved dogs barked blissfully on their porch. They were unaware of what had happened and were only grateful for their pet's safe return. When Jason heard the news, 
he breathed a sigh of relief. He even texted me a single word after they returned. Thanks. Jason finally got the hint and distanced himself from Melissa, getting a job in a city several hours away. Despite his efforts to learn more about Tommy, he was only able to obtain public records indicating Tommy's work as a financial advisor. Recognizing that there was probably more to Tommy than meets the eye, Jason decided to move on and start a new life without his former flame. However, Melissa was aware that as long as Jason lived, he may resurface in her life. I took preemptive actions. Two weeks after the incident, I presented Melissa with a post-nuptial agreement prepared by my attorney. In it, she pledged to give up everything, including her rights to children born during her marriage, in the event of infidelity. While this could not preclude a repeat of her previous actions or a reunion with Jason, it did provide enough incentive for her to ponder the ramifications. Combined with my enhanced attention to her activities and the guarantee that I would be actively watching her, as well as the conditions of the agreement, we were prepared to weather any future storms. Epilogue A year later, Melissa found herself pregnant with their first child, and the couple's closeness had grown significantly. Recognizing the precipice she had once stood on, Melissa vowed to guaranteeing Tommy's happiness and starting a family together. Jason's specter disappeared into oblivion, never to be referenced again, as if he no longer existed. That important day had the ability to change their lives forever. However, Tommy's enduring love and firm approach were vital in saving their marriage. Thank you for spending the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this essay, please like it and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to share regarding your or someone else's circumstance, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.